Good morning. Welcome to Trinity this morning. We're so glad you're here. Uh, it's nice to see the sun. I woke up to the birds singing, which seemed unusual since it was so cold these last few days. I thought, you know, only in New England can we have 60 degrees in December, snow in March, and earthquakes, right? It's just a, it's just a crazy time. But we are so glad you're here. Um, a verse has been going through my head. It's in Psalm 150, and it says, Everyone who has breath, praise the Lord. So I'd like to open our time with some prayer this morning, and I want you guys to be a part of this. I'm going to ask you if you would just pray some attribute, attributes of who God is. Just one word. God, you are. God, you are. And let's fill his house today with praise for him for who he is. Bow your heads with me. I'll start and just shout it out. Let the Lord hear your voice today. Dear Heavenly Father, you are a good God, and we praise your name. God, you are holy. God, you are enough. You are enough. Help us to bring praise to you this morning, not because of who we are, but because of who you are. Bless this time. Amen. Now, would you stand with us? And like the verse says, everyone who has breath, praise the Lord, so there should be no excuses out there. Okay? <laughs> Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul, worship his holy name, sing like never before, oh my soul, I worship your holy name. The sun.
God, you are you're a living hope. Thank you. Thank you that you are everything we need. Amen. And children, you are dismissed. You'll notice there's some flowers up here which are from Casey Stopa's funeral yesterday and just want to remind us to keep the whole Stopa family in our prayers as they continue to kind of live into a, a new season of life, having uh, grieved the loss of their son but also living with the hope that they will see him again in resurrection life. This, uh, this week we, we're going to be starting a, a new series together and, and I'm excited for this series because I think it's going to be a good challenge for us. But before we actually begin to look at this, I want to I encourage us to take a pause. Because over the past year, we've gone through two books. We've, we've studied through, we've, we've examined and walked through and worshipped through two books. We've walked through the gospel of Jesus Christ through the, the book of Mark. And we've also looked at the nature of the church in the, the book of Ephesians. Over the course of a year, that's kind of a cool accomplishment for us as, as people to kind of walk through the scriptures together. So I just think it's important for us to take a pause and look back on where we've come from and where we are today. Because it's also because of those very things, because of the, the person of Jesus Christ and his institution of this church, not just this body here, but the body of Christ across time and geography, that we're going to be looking at this life that he's now invited us into and living into. I think that's, that's a pretty cool invitation that he's, just, that he's, he's given us through the scriptures. Now, where the gospel of Mark left us last week was an empty tomb. But both the cross and the empty tomb invite our responses, right? We, we don't just respond to the fact that Jesus died on the cross for our sins. We're also invited to respond to the fact that Jesus rose from the grave to give us life. And so we've got to ask ourselves, do I, do I believe that Jesus is the one that God promised to send to reverse the curse of sin? to turn on its head those things that, that were destructive and destroying this world? Do I believe that Jesus' death was, was satisfactory? It was, a, it was a satisfactory substitute for my own guilt, my own sin. Do I, do I actually believe that Jesus rose from the grave and, and that because he rose from the grave, I too can see that I'll have life as well in him, that, that we'll have life together in him. I mean, are we willing to respond to the empty tomb and ask these questions and really think about how we might respond to those questions? And lastly, do I, do I believe that, that when he rose from the grave, he not just only rose from the grave to give life, but he has the actual power to give that life to those who believe in him? So I think the empty tomb invites us to respond one way or the other. We really only have two options. You cannot ignore it because ignoring the empty tomb is really equivalent to just choosing not to believe it, right? The, the, the tomb was empty. That's a historical fact. And so we're left to decide, do I believe that something miraculous, God-ordained happened or, or not? But we can't ignore it. We've got to consider it. And, and in, in, in exploring and considering that empty tomb, this new series kind of invites us to think on the other side of the empty tomb. If he really rose from the grave, which we believe, which I believe is true, then what? Now what? What are we to do? How are we to live? Where do we go from there? What do we do knowing that Jesus rose from the grave for a reason, for a purpose, and it's to give us life? I think if we were to ask ourselves, okay, so now what? It would be an easy answer for us to say, well, why not go to the end of the Gospel of Matthew or the beginning of the, the book of Luke and, and see where Jesus sends his disciples out with a purpose and a mission? That's a great answer to the now what. How do we live after the empty tomb? It, we, we're to live as Jesus' witnesses, first in Jerusalem and then Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. In other words, we're supposed to be telling people about this empty tomb. That's, that's a fair answer to the question of now what. 
But I, I, think, I think there's more to this idea of what our response, or what, what sort of response we're called to uh, offer up in response to the empty tomb. See, this, this idea of, of our purpose and our commission being witnesses of Jesus Christ or going forth and making disciples of all the nations presupposes an ongoing life that's living and true in us. In other words, it's not just something we're supposed to go out and do, but we go out and do these things because of the reality that we've accepted in our hearts, that we are entering into a new life through Jesus Christ. And in response to that new life that's given to us through the empty tomb, we then go out and be witnesses of Jesus, first in Jerusalem, Judea, and to Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. So I think Jesus did tell us that he came to seek and to save the lost. He did say that we've got a message to save those who are broken and hurting and feel isolated and separated from the God who created them and who loves them. He certainly came to do that. But he didn't just come to save us from our past. He came to save us into a future. He came to save us into a life that was ahead of us, that was there then and and ahead of us. He didn't defeat death on the cross just so that he could fix your anger problem and then send you on your way. He, he, didn't, he didn't come just to address your, your financial struggles or your health struggles and then just kind of fade back into the background of your life once things are running smoothly again and everything's back under control. So I think the struggle for many of us when we think about this idea of, of the life that Jesus invites us into, and especially in this fast-paced world where things are coming at us left and right, is that we've settled to treat Jesus like a can of fix-a-flat. You know, like if your tire is getting low, and it's not quite clearly a, there's a hole in the tire and you need a new tire. I mean, this is maybe not what a mechanic would actually suggest you do, but, you know, you go get one of those cans where you just, you, 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 you inject it into your tires and it gives you more life in your tires and you can keep going, right? When our lives seem to be deflated, we almost treat our Christianity as something where we, we kind of take Jesus off the shelf and ask him to help us in our circumstance and then once things are going smoothly again, or once we get past it a little bit, we, we say thank you for doing your job, and then we put it back on the, on the shelf to be pulled off the shelf next time we run into a situation where we need him. But this is the problem. This is maybe not the problem, but this is maybe a challenge I'd like to invite you to consider. Is Jesus didn't just come to seek and to save us from our past. In other words, he didn't just come to be that can of fix-a-flat on the shelf that you pull off the shelf every now and then when you need him. He came to save us to an entirely new life, both now and in the future. In other words, Jesus is the very air we breathe. He's he's meant to walk with us in every moment of our day, to be present to us. He's got something to say, to speak into our circumstances, to to help us navigate relationships, to, to help us think about what we're concerned about or frightened of, or even help enlighten moments where we want to celebrate and give thanks for what he's doing in our lives. Jesus is meant to be there, not just when we need him and need to take him off the shelf, but every moment of our days. And so... Paul encourages us in Romans 12 to think about this new life. Our passage today will be in Romans chapter 12, just two verses. And, and, and in these two verses, I think we hear Paul invite us into this ongoing, continual, continuous life of renewal and transformation. Let me read, us, read for us these verses in Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. Paul says this, he says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Let me give thanks for God's word. Heavenly Father, we do thank you that, you that you have spoken, that you have revealed yourself to us. Lord, in the midst of our circumstances, in the midst of our worlds, in the midst of, uh, of how much we know you or don't know you, I pray that your Holy Spirit will, will reveal you to us this morning. May your word be so clear to us, Lord. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 
<clears throat> well, Paul has some important things that he wants to share with us in these, these two verses. Our, our ESV translation, the English Standard Version, says that, that, that Paul's appealing to us. I appeal to you, therefore. But I think it, it has a little bit more umph than what the ESV is, is showing us here. It has a little bit more umph in the, in the Greek. It, it's more like he's saying, hey, I really want you to pay attention here. I've got something that's important that I want you to hear, but I don't want you to just hear it. I want you to realize this is something to commit to. Right? He's not so, going so far to say, you must do this. You have to do this, and if you don't, you're a horrible person. No, but, but, it's, but it's more than just, oh, would you please consider this? Right? It's somewhere there in the middle that he's saying, listen up, pay attention. I've got something important I really want to share with you. I, I, I know you need to hear it. Now, as Tara and I have grown in our marriage, I, I've come to learn that if I want or need something, I need to be assertive. Right? I, I can't be wishy-washy. I, I can't say to her, well, you know, if, if you feel like it, if, if you really, if you don't mind, if you want to, you know, would you mind maybe putting a little bit of gas in the gas tank? Because it's on empty right now, and you left me with an empty tank. <laughs> so maybe that's, that's the other part of it. She thinks it's me who leaves it on an empty tank. I think it's her. But that's for another sermon. No, I mean, if I, if I need that, right, if I, if I need her to put something in the tank, I need to be assertive and say, hey, it would be helpful if you would put gas in the car when the gas light is on and it says you've got one mile left to empty, right? That's being assertive. That's saying this is what I need. Paul's being assertive here. It's not a command. I'm not commanding Tara to put gas in the tank. I wouldn't do that because I know it doesn't work. Um, <laughs> But I, but I also know that that's not how we're called to, to, to step into this. It's not going to get the result that I want. And Paul knows the result he wants is for people to do what he's about to invite us to do. And so he's not going to command them, but he's also going to say, I really think you need to hear me when I say this. I really want you to, I, it would be very good for you to pay attention, to lean in, and really consider committing to the life that we're invited to live into with Jesus. And so what is it exactly that he's urging them to do? Well, Paul says he's urging them to present themselves as a living sacrifice. He's inviting them to present themselves in the context of a sacrifice, not just their hearts. Don't just give me your will. Don't just, don't just give this part of my life. He's saying, I, 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 want, I want your heart. I want your wallet. I want your huge muscles. I want your whole body. I want your entire self to be committed to this life that God has made available to us through Jesus Christ. That's not just part of us. Now, this is not one of those moments where he's saying, hey, you, you got to present yourself to God. And, and, and this is not one of those moments where you turn to God and say, now presenting a, a work of your own hands, the amazing and wonderful Dan Van Horn, you know, and then, then expect to hear this heavenly praise sound coming from the sky. No, that, that's not what he's doing. He's, he's inviting people he wants the people here who are listening to him to recognize that in response to the empty tomb, we bring a sacrifice to God, a living sacrifice, the sacrifice of ourselves to the, to the altar. But, but this is where our confusion may be, because sacrifices, if I remember correctly, if, I, if, if I've got this right, sacrifices are meant to die. Sacrifices are a substitution. They were, they were to atone for sin in the Bible. They were, they were meant to, to die in the place of the person who's presenting the sacrifice. So how do I, how, what am I supposed to do with a living sacrifice? Didn't, and, and didn't we just celebrate Jesus' substitution on the cross in our place? Well, yeah, but that's not the whole story of, of Easter. right? The Easter story continues and travels through the empty tomb and out into the world, and it's still being told today. It's being told today, not through dead sacrifices, but through living sacrifices. Listen to how Paul talks about this in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. It's two verses, verses 14 and 15. Paul says, For the love of Christ controls us because we've concluded this, that one has died for all, Therefore, all have died. We've all already died, church. In Jesus' death, we joined him within, with him in his death so that we might join him in his life as well. So we've all died, and he died 
for all. That those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who for their sake died and was raised. See, Jesus' sacrifice was, was something that paid a debt he, he didn't deserve, paid our debt, but it also accomplished the life we now live into. His sacrifice was the once-for-all sacrifice, and by faith, we too have died with him so that we might live with him and for him. So we aren't bringing a sacrifice to die, but one to live. That's an important distinction, church. See, our lives tell the story of the resurrection. They're proof that God has the power to raise Jesus to life and also has the power to raise me to new life. Jeff, we, we celebrated your son's life yesterday. Casey was someone who learned to trust in the fact that he, his life had died in Christ Jesus and was being raised to new life with Jesus. But it didn't end there because story after story, person after person, told a story about Casey, about a love that was true in him that he wanted to share with others, a love he connected to through his faith that, that God had, had created him with. And as he came to God and learned more about this love, it blossomed like this tree out of the ground, bearing much fruit in the lives of the people around him. See, that's how we, we bring a living sacrifice to the altar. Our lives, like Casey's, tell the story of the resurrection. And so as a living sacrifice, we're not dying on the altar. We're actually living on the altar. And so when anyone looks upon that altar, what they see is the power of God. The power of God to rescue us, to redeem us, to transform us, to renew us. And that's a really powerful thing. When you think about the people around you in this world, the struggles that they face, the, the, the troubles in their lives, the, the things not just out there in the world, but even the, the, the things they face within themselves, there's only one who can actually do the work of transforming them and renewing them so that they are a conqueror of that brokenness. And the one is Jesus Christ. And so we are a living sacrifice on the altar so that all who look upon the altar might see the power of God to transform and renew our lives. It's not just our heart we bring to the altar and leave the, our hearts there and, and kind of go back to whatever we're doing. It's not just our minds that we're offering. Lord, I'll let you kind of like give me more knowledge and, and, and I'll give my mind my focus of my attention to that. It's, it's our entire bodies, our whole selves. Jesus isn't talking about just some spiritual sacrifice we bring. He's, he's actually, in the context of our whole bodies, he's talking about mind, body, and soul. Our spiritual act of worship is physical, it's spiritual, it's emotional, it's relational. It's, in, it's a whole life wrapped up onto the altar so that the world may see that Jesus alone has the power to transform and renew our lives. I mean, we love singing, Lord, I give you my heart. I give you my soul. Have your way in me. But what if we added a couple lines like, Lord, I, I give you my, my energy. I, I give you the amount of sleep I'm getting. I give you my, my muscles. I give you, you know, whatever. I give you my, my, my diet, you know, my health, whatever. I give you all of these things because I want my whole self be used for your purposes. I want to live completely and fully into this new life that you invite me into through Jesus Christ. Do you understand what I'm saying? See, we, we, we present our entire lives back to God, not so that we would die, but so that we might really live. We might really come to know what this new life is, not just uh, you know, kind of feeling the guilt of our past washed away, but that we might understand the fullness of the life that God has for us, his children, the people he loves dearly. If only we will come to him and trust in the work that his son did on the cross. This is, based, this is what, what Paul tells the Galatian believers, right? My old self, it was nothing special. This is my paraphrase, by the way. This is not an actual interpretation of the script. In my old self, it was nothing special, it was crucified with Christ, and now it's not me who lives, 
but Christ who lives in me. So I'm gonna live this life by faith in the one who loved me and gave himself up for me. Right, it's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. So what, is, what does it mean or what does it look like to live for Jesus? Well, it looks like total commitment to him. It's not one foot in this kingdom and one foot in the world. Or not one foot in the kingdom of heaven and one foot in this world. That was my testimony, by the way. When I came to faith as a young man, I had kind of come to this breaking point where I realized I was living one way with my family. I wanted them to know how good of a person, a Christian I was. And I was living a much different way in the, in the world, kind of living with contradictory values to the kingdom of God. And, and I, I got to a point where I realized I could no longer lie to myself. I, I can't live with one foot in the kingdom of heaven and one foot in this world. God was inviting me to make total commitment to him. Paul says in Romans chapter 12, verse 2, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. In other words, don't model your thinking and your behavior after the patterns of this world, of this age. Don't let this current world shape your thinking into thinking that they've got it right. Listen, generation after generation, our thinking as human beings apart from God has changed. Well, the, old, you know, the, the previous generation got it wrong, but the new generation, we're going to get it right. That's, I mean, that's the, every generation does that. Every generation goes through this where we think this new generation, we're going to fix the world's problems because the last generation got it wrong, right? That, that's just the, the pattern of the thinking of this age speaking, Right? So he's saying, don't, don't model your thinking, your behavior after the patterns of this, of this world, of this age, but be transformed. Here, here's where I, I want to pause for a moment, because it's not just worldly thinking that's the problem. Sometimes it's religious thinking that's the problem. I, I don't know, uh, maybe some of you might, um, might remember someone saying this growing up, but I, I don't know if you've ever, as a young Christian girl, said, I don't smoke, I don't chew, and I don't go with boys who do. Anyone... Anyone? No one? Okay, yeah, there's, yeah there's, there's some of us here who have heard that. I guess it's maybe a little bit, never mind, I won't, I won't out anyone's age in like that. But, but that's, that's not what Paul is saying here in Romans chapter 12, verse 2, right? Paul's not focused on our actions. He's not focused on our exterior behavior. He's focused on our interior life. Paul actually says, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your Behaviors? No. Your mind, right? It's not the actions that Paul is focused on here, but the thinking of our minds that informs our behaviors. Paul's saying, hey, if you want to live into this new life, I'm not going to, I'm not going to make you, I'm not going to say you have to do this, this, and this. He's saying commit your mind to being transformed and renewed. And as you do, God will transform your behavior. The fruit, the outward aspect of your life, the fruit of your behavior is dependent on God doing a work of transformation and rene renewal in your heart and mind. And that happens as we commit ourselves, as we submit ourselves to being transformed in our minds. This means that Maybe when I come across something in this world and, and I, I just feel that little nudge, that little uh, kind of you know, push that, that this feels like a little bit contrary to God's good and perfect will, well, you know what? That, that's like a spotlight on your life where you realize you're coming to this knowledge. You're, you're thinking on this because guess what? Your mind and your heart is in the process of being renewed. It's in the process of being transformed. So be encouraged if you get that moment, you're like, man, I'm not sure if I feel like that is actually in line with God's word. It, it may, or, or may or may not be in line with God's will, and that's something we're going to get to in a minute because you're going to have to make sure, you know, you want to you make sure that what you're seeing and noticing and observing is in line with God's will, but at the very least recognize something that when you see that gap between thinking or behavior in this world and what you think and believe about God's word, that, that should encourage you enough to know, hey, I am in process of being renewed and transformed. And that alone should give us hope. See, only then, when we're in this, when we've committed to the, to the, the, the process of renewal and transformation, this ongoing life, can we respond in obedience to God. 
right? We can respond to the will of God out of willing and desiring uh, to, to be obedient to him because our hearts and our minds have been transformed. So we're not doing it out of religious obligation, but man, because we want to. We're excited about it. We think that's, that's where I'm most content and most joy-filled when I'm walking in the will of God. So this is probably one, one question that every Christian asks. God, what's your will for my life? What do you want me to do, God? How should I handle this? God, write it in the sky. Hit me across the face with the message. Whatever you have to do, just let me know what is your will. It's also, it's a sim- there's a similar question that those who don't walk with Jesus, who aren't uh, close with God, they also ask a very similar question. What's my purpose in life? Why am I here? It's a very common question question. Here's the good news. Christianity answers both questions, right? More specifically, God has, has the answer to both questions, and he's, he's actually chosen to reveal those answers through his prophets in the past, and now through his son, the life of his son, Jesus. What this means then for us is that in committing to the life of renewal and transformation, we need, to, we need to learn and understand God's will as he's revealed it to us. We need to read and know it. We need to study what God has revealed to us in the scriptures. See, God doesn't want this to be a secret. He, he's, not, he's, not, he's not sitting there saying, oh man, if only they knew what I had planned for them and the way their life is going to go, this, would be, this is going to be hilarious. Watch what they do here. That's not what God is doing. His plan, his purpose, his will for your life is not a secret. He has chosen to reveal it to us. He wants you to know your purpose. He wants to know how you fit into his plan. Why? Because God is gracious and he's merciful. And he freely shows you the answers to the questions you're asking. If we will only take the time to listen to Jesus and to seek God out in his word, to seek out the answers he's already given. So let me just say one more thing before I spend a couple of minutes applying these verses to our lives. See, in, in nearly every culture and every world religion known to mankind, if we want something, we need to give something. If we want something from a lowercase g God, We need to appease that God and make an offering so that the God will be happy with us and give us what we want. If if you want your child to have knowledge, well, you need to pay. Just ask any any parent of a child in college right now or, or even a college graduate who's paying off student loans. You need to pay for that knowledge. It doesn't come free. You want mercy? You need to beg for forgiveness. You want a favor? You need to be ready to offer a favor. See, the the way our world works, you have to give before you get. But that's not actually how the God of the Bible operates. In fact, the God of the Bible reveals himself to us as one who does just the opposite. Some theologians say that with God, the indicatives come before the imperatives. In other words, the truthful facts about God have been done, that, that he's done, go first, and after that, flowing out of that, are the invitations and the, the, the commitments that God invites us into as a result of the things that God has already done. In other words, you don't have to do this, you don't have to act a certain way, behave a certain way, observe a certain way, in order to God, for God to be gracious and merciful to you. God is gracious and merciful. End of story, end of sen- sentence. And then next sentence As a result of those things, God invites us to live into this new life that he's created for us. What God has done for us comes before what he asks of us. In Romans 12, 1, Paul's urgent appeal to the Roman Christians comes on the basis of one thing. Let's see if you can tell me what it is. In Romans 12, 1, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. What's the basis for God inviting us into this life of transformation and renewal? God's mercies. Not our, not our obedience, not, not, our, not our successes, or he doesn't hold our failures against us. He invites us into this life purely on the basis 
of God's mercies. Now, these mercies are what Paul's been talking about in the book of Romans up to where we are now. From basically Romans chapter 3 up to the beginning of chapter 12, he's been laying out all these things that God has done, and it's on the basis of these things that he urges us to step into the continual life of renewal. Some examples. God made his righteousness known to us through faith in his son, Jesus Christ. He delivers us from the state of sin and misery and transfers us into the life. He's merciful in that he no longer condemns us and instead condemns sin in the flesh. He upheld justice toward us at his own expense. He fulfilled the law and justifies us by faith and clothed us in the righteousness of Christ. He mercifully gives us his joy and his hope. He graciously enables us to walk in the newness of life through Jesus. He mercifully gives us an inheritance with Christ and adopts us as his children. This means he gives us a future and a purpose and promises for everyone who calls on the name of Jesus. This is the basis for which we present our bodies as living sacrifices. This is the foundation of why we can be a living sacrifice, be a witness for the power of God's resurrection, the new life. Not because, man, look how much I'm in love with God. Let me show you all the ways. No, because of the mercies of God, because of the things that God has done in going first. In other words, we don't have to live a a life of renewal because we have to in order to get something from God. We live a life of ongoing renewal because we've come to know what God has done for us. I think that's a very important distinction for us, church, because the habit of our human minds is so ingrained in this idea that we have to prove we are committed in order for God to be gracious to us. But our error is not realizing and recognizing what God has actually already done for us. To not live in that love and that adoration and that that appreciation. Church, Jesus endured the cross and conquered the grave so that we could live with him. He did it so that we could be with him. That was his joy. God went first, and on, on the basis of his many mercies, he invites us to join him in this life. He says, come along with me. Come walk with me. Walk like me. See this new life, a, a, a life of, of righteousness and grace and, and compassion and justice. Now, there's always going to be a place in your life that Jesus is willing to work on if you let him. So commit yourself to him. Commit yourself to that life. Commit yourself to to trusting him to shape you in his workmanship, to to, to be his masterpiece. Let him chisel away those things that are are blemishes and, and strengthen up those parts of you that he's created you with, the heart that reflects his kingdom and his glory. Church, in order to do these things, you need to taste and see and personally know all the things that God has already done for you. Don't hear me say, this is how you be a good Christian. Hear me say, look at all the things that God has done for you. Don't overlook them. Live in them. Soak in them. Understand the depth of his love for you. Only then will you have the courage to make the commitment of faith in living into this life of ongoing transformation and renewal. And so how do we do this? Well, first, we're going to commit our mind to it. We're going we're gonna to think on it. We're going to commit our minds to thinking on this life that God has, has invited us into through Jesus Christ. In 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 5, Paul says, We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ. What this means, church, is that we live in a world with many competing thoughts and ideas. It's not just God versus this world. It's God versus many different ideas as to what people think is right and wrong, good and bad, true and untrue. And what we, what we have to hear here is that God's invitation is to not submit our thinking to God's word, but submit God's word to our thinking. 
If you want to be transformed and, and renewed in your mind, then you have to understand that, that if, there's a, if there's a disagreement between the will of God and your thinking, guess which one is wrong, probably? Well, is wrong. It's your thinking, right? We need to look at God's word to say this is true and good. We need to take captive every thought that comes to our mind, thoughts that give us fear and concern, but thoughts that also make us uh, feel like God, like, that contradict God's will for our life. Think, God doesn't love me. God doesn't care for me. He doesn't have a future. He doesn't have a plan for me. He doesn't care about what I do in this part of my life. We need to take every one of those thoughts captive and hold them up against the promises of God and then say, which of these is really true? It's got to be the word of God, the promises of God. So God's word is a priority, and if our, if our thinking doesn't line up with God's word, we need to really ask ourselves, which of these do I really need to believe here? And we live, we live in a day and age where, where more and more people don't really trust authority. And, and, and as followers of Christ, we declare that Jesus' word is authority. It's the highest authority we can have. And so if, you're, if we're living in, in the patterns of this world, say that there's really no trustworthy authority, well, then maybe we need to say, hey, I don't want to conform to that pattern. I don't want to conform to that scheme of man. I want to actually submit myself to the fact that, no, there actually is an authority in my life, and it's the word of God. Only God's word is gracious and merciful, justice, just and, and perfect, righteous and true, and freely given to me at, at no cost to myself. So commit your mind to thinking on God's word and consider the truth within. Secondly, cultivate a heart of gratitude. I, I think to commit ourselves to this life of ongoing transformation and renewal, we need to set our eyes on what God has already done for us. And I think that that comes in cultivating a heart of gratitude, a life of gratitude. Paul says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Now here's the thing. We know that this past December, my sister went home to be with the Lord after battling brain cancer. And, and that, was a, that was a real struggle for me. But there was this moment where I'm like, how, how is this happening, God? I'm overcome with grief and, and, and pain and anguish, and yet somehow I'm feeling hope and joy in the very same moment. It doesn't make sense to me. And, and, I, and more and more I've realized that, that what I'm paying attention to, what I give the attention of my heart and my mind to, actually plays a role in, in me being committed to the life I want to live. And what I mean to say is that in the midst of my grief, I was reminded of all the things that I was thankful for. I'm thankful that I will see my sister again. I'm thankful that she is no longer in pain. I am thankful that she is whole, that she is walking with Jesus. I am, I am thankful that she's at peace. I'm thankful to imagine where she is right now, even in the midst of me wanting her to be here with me, right in this very moment. You better believe that the challenge to, to rejoice always, pray without ceasing, giving thanks in all circumstances, was a great challenge to help me walk through this season of grief because it reminded me that, that the immediacy of my circumstances, the pain of my separation from my sister, is not the end. That I will see her again. That she is healed and whole, and it gave me hope and, and encouraged me and strengthened me to keep walking in this life that God has invited me into through his son, Jesus Christ. See, rejoicing and praying and giving thanks are all necessary to having a receptive heart and mind to God doing his work of renewal in our lives. Don't believe me? All right, here's a challenge for you. I want you to sit down today Put your phone, computer, whatever, all distractions away, just a notebook and a pen, and I want you to get up from where you are until you've listed 50 things that you are thankful for. I, it, it, you may say, oh, that's impossible. It's not impossible. 
and in fact, I think it's very possible, we just don't take the time to think on the things that we have to be thankful for. We don't take the time to think about the imperative or the indicatives of God, the things that he's already done. But when we do, when we remember those things, it empowers us and fuels us to commit ourselves to the life of ongoing transformation and renewal. I guarantee that by the time you're done writing your list of 50, your countenance will be lifted and you'll be more attentive to the source of your gratitude. You'll be more aware of who it is that has given you reason to be thankful and to rejoice always. And so finally, as you remember God's mercy, celebrate it. Don't just think on it. Don't just dwell on it by, by, by cultivating a life of gratitude, but celebrate it. That, that's our goal. When we gather each Sunday morning, it, it's not so that we can each get a sticker when we walk in the door and say, you went to church today, good job. It, we're here to celebrate God, to celebrate what he's done, to be reminded of the goodness of God, his comfort for us, his presence with us throughout our lives, every moment of every day. That's our goal when we gather on, on every Sunday morning. And, and here's the thing, church, you don't have to wait for Sunday morning to do this. You could have your own personal rhythms of worship throughout the week to remind you day by day that God is with you through his son, Jesus Christ, who has given you the Holy Spirit to dwell within you and to walk with you. You can have your own personal rhythms of worship. So giving thanks taking every thought captive and remembering and celebrating are all rhythms we're invited to live into in this life. They're, they're like garden tools in the hands of a master gardener. But I, what I want us to realize is that, that these are not meant to be burdensome religious practices. They're meant to be gracious rhythms of life that God works in to encourage us and empower us to live this ongoing life of renewal and transformation. So your, your, your renewal, church, your, de, your transformation, it's not dependent on your, obil, your ability to obey. Right? It's not dependent on, uh, on how many days can you keep your New Year's resolution, resolution going. Right? I mean, we've all done that where it's lasted at best like a week, right? This is not the case here. These things are, 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 are not the things that God's waiting for you to be obedient in before he actually does a work of transformation and renewal in your life. Your renewal and your transformation are dependent on one thing. Well, kind of two things, but they're really the same thing. The endless grace and mercy of your heavenly Father. You, you, you want to see God do a work in your life? Just commit yourself to it by faith and see what he will do not because you're doing a good job looking to him or trusting him, but because he is a God, he's a, he's a heavenly father who is endlessly pouring out his grace and mercy upon us. Matt Papa and Matt Boswell, they, they wrote a, a hymn together called His Mercy is More. It's a great hymn to listen to sometime if you have a chance. And there's a, there's a line in the hymn that says, Our sins, they are many, but his mercy is more. Church, hear that. Our sins, they are many, but guess what? His mercy is more. It's not dependent on, on how much or how little of sin you have in your life. God's mercy goes first. That's the indicative. That's who he is. That's what he's done. And flowing out of his mercies, when, when we're so aware of his mercies in our life, we can't help but be overwhelmed with the reality that we have a loving God who wants to be in a relationship with us and is inviting us to follow him, to commit our ways to him, to submit to his leadership in our life, his authority in our lives. The, the two hymn writers, Matt Papa and Matt Boswell, when I was reading a story about when they wrote the song, the, 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 that line, our sins there are many, his mercy is more, comes out of a text in Romans chapter 5, verse 20, where Paul writes, where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. It, no matter how much sin you think is in your life, guess what? Grace abounded even more. 
And that means, church, that should mean, that should, at the very least, that should be a clear symbol to you that God wants to make a way. He will, he will pull out every stop so that he could be in a relationship with you if you would just trust in Jesus' work in your life and commit your ways to him. So stop worrying about whether or not you're good enough or obedient enough to live in the kingdom. Stop focusing on all the things you've done wrong. Focus on what God has already done. Focus on his grace and his mercy. Our acceptance into the family of God and the kingdom of God, it it, it comes as we trust in that grace, as we trust in Jesus' mercy shown to us, as as we trust in the, the, the Father's mercy shown to us through Jesus Christ. So church, be transformed by the continual renewal of your minds as we live with gratitude, as we think on God's mercy, and as we celebrate his grace. You can live this life of renewal, not because you're good enough, but because of his grace alone. That's why I'm excited for this this series for us to walk through, because I know it's not dependent on how much you hear of me up front and how much you apply to your life when you walk out the doors, but because it's purely dependent on God's grace and mercy. So let's notice those things. Let's notice his mercies. Let's notice his grace. God is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or imagine. Let me pray for us. Heavenly Father, we, we are, Lord, I, I pray that you would meet our, our feeble minds where they're at. Lord, if, if, there is a, if there is a flicker of hope in our hearts that we want to, if we want to commit our ways to you, Lord, hear that desire and may that be the mustard seed of faith that grows into a gigantic tree, Lord. Lord, help for those of us who need to see it, help us to see your grace and your mercies, the things you've already done. Father, if, if it's a matter of those of us who, who are already aware of that, the, your grace and your mercy, help us to see it even more. And help us to trust that that alone is what you will do to, to, to empower and strengthen and, and, and carry us into this life of ongoing transformation and renewal. Soften our hearts, Lord. Open our minds, transform our, uh, our, our life through the renewal of our minds so that we might think the things of God and, and that the fruit of the Spirit might bear its, its, its work in our, our, uh, in our lives, coming from the very core of our hearts and flowing out of us. Father God, we thank you that you are a God who is gracious and merciful. May we be abundantly aware of that as we trust you, Lord, to have your way in us, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, one of the ways that we can actually do this, to remember God's grace and mercy, and probably the most obvious way for us to do that, is when we come to the table, the Lord's table. When we have the opportunity to celebrate communion together, we have the opportunity to look to the cross, to remember what Jesus has done for us. And to not just look to the cross, but also remember the empty grave on the other side of the cross three days later. And not just to look to see the empty grave, but to realize that because of what Jesus has done for us, because of God sent forth his son to this earth in the form of man, And because his son was obedient even to the point of death, even death on the cross, we too might live as living sacrifices. And so remembering that time is is a very important time for us to not look and and feel guilty or ashamed or to be also aware of our brokenness, but to remember that it's God's grace and mercy. It's his grace and mercy that we're here today. And to give thanks for that. And that's the, the Lord's table is, is a time for us to give thanks for that. I'd like to invite our deacons to come forward who are going to be helping with serving this morning. And, and, and the way we celebrate the Lord's Supper here at Trinity is in a moment our worship team will play a song. And, and as they do, we're going to invite... Uh, let's see, why don't you guys come over here. We're going to invite you to come forward and, and, and take the elements. 
that if you uh, would like to celebrate this moment with us, if you put your faith in Jesus Christ and you want to uh, partake in this time of celebration and gratitude, then we would invite you to come forward. Whether you're a member of Trinity or not, it does not matter. What matters is that you're celebrating what Jesus has done on your behalf. And so in a moment, as the worship team plays, I'll invite you to come down this, the, the middle aisles here. You can receive the elements from our, our deacons and then go back and sit down. And after we're done with that song, we'll actually take the elements together and celebrate the Lord's Supper together. So let me pray and invite us into this time and, and, and then we will. Heavenly Father, we do give you thanks for a chance to celebrate the gift we have in Jesus Christ, the gift of new life, the gift of, of the power of God at work in us, not because we've showed our love for you or our obedience of you, but because you are gracious and merciful in sending forth your son. May we trust in that truth, Lord, and depend upon that and commit our ways to you. Thank you for sending us Jesus, our Savior, the Messiah. We pray this in his name. Amen. Come forward as you're able, and if you're not able to leave your seat, would you just raise your hand up and one of our serv um, servers will come and bring the elements to you.
guys in that room sitting already. <laughs> Pastor Moses, will you join me up here? You know, one of the ways that we like to celebrate the Lord's Supper together is to kind of share the meal together, right? It's not one where the, the holy pastor offers the meal to you, but one where we partake in Jesus' way together of the meal, the meal of his body broken for us and his blood, blood poured out that, that gave us, that clothes us in righteousness, that made it possible so when God looks upon us, he doesn't see my sins, but he sees the righteousness of Christ. And so we come to this table with hearts of gratitude. You know, we're told that on the night that Jesus was betrayed, after the supper, he took the bread and he broke it and he said, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And so, Pastor Moses, I offer you the body of Christ which is broken for you. Pastor Dan, the body of Christ broken for you. Thanks, brother. Brothers and sisters, let's take and eat in remembrance of Jesus. And in the same way, he took the cup and said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The body of Christ, the, the blood of Christ shed for you, Pastor Dan. Drink. Let's pray. Gracias, Señor, te damos. Gracias por el sacrificio que hiciste por nosotros. Gracias por tu bondad. Siempre lo decimos, Señor, porque somos indignos de ese sacrificio. Mas tu palabra nos dice que aún siendo pecadores, tú moriste por nosotros y te damos gracias. No hay palabras, Señor, para para decir nuestro agradecimiento por ese sacrificio santo y perfecto. Simplemente te podemos dar gracias. Ayúdanos, Señor, a vivir a la luz de ese sacrificio, que te glorifiquemos con nuestras vidas. Como, dice, como dijo el mensaje, Señor, que nos entreguemos, Señor, en sacrificio vivo, agradable a ti, para la gloria y honra de tu nombre. En el nombre de Jesús. Gracias, Señor. Amen. Amen. Well, church, as we come to the conclusion of our service together, I want to encourage you that we are not dead sacrifices, we are living sacrifices, which means as we go out from here, our worship and our celebration and our fellowship doesn't end, but it continues on. And so uh, I'd like to invite you to, to go down the hall afterwards for fellowship. We actually, the men's fellowship, the square one men's Bible study on Thursday morning is hosting coffee hour, and so I promise it's going to be more than Elio's pizzas and the toaster and things like that. It's going to, I'm pretty sure it's going to be some pretty nice food down there, coffee, continuing fellowship. That, too, is our, our spiritual act of worship. When, when the body of Christ comes together, encourages, laughs together, prays together, and, and celebrates what God has done. Let's go out as living sacrifices, letting the world see the treasures that we've found in Jesus Christ. Would you stand as we close with this benediction? After the service, we'll have volunteers for, come uh, up here who would be happy to pray with you if anyone would like someone to pray with them. I'll be up here as well, happy to pray with you. But now receive the benediction. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. Go in peace.